Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Eidelman, Vice Principal and Dean of the McGill's Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. Bonjour à tous. Je me présente David Eidelman, Vice Principal et Doyen de la Faculty of Medicine et des Sciences de la Santé de McGill. C'est un grand honneur pour, de vous accueillir à la cinquième conférence de prestige et cérémonie de remise des prix du département d'oncologie Gerald Bronfman. Welcome everyone to the fifth Gerald Bronfman Department of Oncology Distinguished Lecture and Award Ceremony. I want to make a particularly warm welcome for our distinguished lecturer for 2021, Nobel laureate, Dr. Randy Sheckman, and to this year's fellowship recipients and award laureates we will recognize shortly. Although we've made progress in the last year, unfortunately, we find ourselves, as you can see, in the midst of an ongoing pandemic, and so we are forced to hold this distinguished lecture and award ceremony virtually once again. Nevertheless, despite the challenges of the past year, the McGill Oncology community perseveres, and really, it's moving from strength to strength. During the course of the past year, the department created a task force to look at the impact of COVID-19 on cancer, as well as another task force focused on global oncology, both have been very successful. And the first of its kind graduate diploma, diploma was launched in 2020, and this has also been a success uh, in the first year it's been offered. The department, led currently by Eduardo Franco and Jerry Battis before him, uh, and which was founded by Dr. Brian Leland Jones, who we're going to hear more about, the department's first chair, we're going to hear more about today, is one of the faculty's largest and most vibrant and really a great source of pride for McGill. It's a hub for our McGill Oncology Network strengths of which are in teaching research and, and uh, clinical care, including clinical research, and it's for which it's internationally known. We're very grateful for the longtime support of the Gerald Bronfman family, after which the department is named. And so it gives me great pleasure to open this year's Distinguished Lecture and Award Ceremony in celebration of that support and the department's continued academic excellence and commitment to our patients. Dr. Eduardo Franco, Distinguished Chair of the department, James McGill Professor, in Oncology and Epidemiology, Biostatistics and Occupational Health, Director of the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and holder of the Minda de Gunsberg Chair in Oncology will lead the proceedings. Without further ado, over to you, Eduardo. Thank you much, very much, Dean Eidelman. I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to our fifth annual Distinguished Lecture and Award Ceremony of the Gerald Bronfman Department of Oncology. Once again, as an entirely online event. The Dean and I, the distinguished speaker, award recipients and their nominators are attending this session via Zoom, but a large community of colleagues and trainees, friends and families of our award recipients and others are attending this event live via YouTube hosted by McGill's Multimedia Division. In addition to being a celebration, this event is also to show our gratitude to the Bronfman family whose gifts permitted the establishment of our department more than 30 years ago. The department's mission statement serves as a constant guidance for our actions. It reads as follows. <clears throat> McGill University's Gerald Bronfman Department of Oncology is dedicated to delivering excellence and leadership in cancer research and treatment, in the education and training of health professionals and cancer researchers, and in the advancement of all aspects of cancer control and prevention. Through education, research, policymaking, and public engagement, our goal is to better understand, prevent, treat, and cure this disease as well as to improve the quality of life of individuals with cancer throughout the disease trajectory. <clears throat> as you can see, cancer research is a very prominent pillar of our department's existence, and few people are, are as well positioned to speak about that as Dr. Randy Shackman, our distinguished speaker for 2021. And I'll give you uh, just a brief overview about uh, the, the prominence of our, of our distinguished speaker. Dr. Shackman is a cell biologist who has made major discoveries related to cell membrane assembly, how cells affect the vesicular transport and how the Golgi apparatus functions as part of a complex secretory pathway. He and his team have studied the simple eukaryote yeast, as well as human cells to investigate mechanisms of intracellular vesicular transport and formation of extracellular vesicles and their subset called exosomes. These exosomes serve as conveyors for proteins, lipids and RNA to bring them from parent cells to distant tissues as part of normal and pathological functions. Because of his prominent work on intracellular vesicle traffic and genetic control of this process, he received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2013. But let us go back further in time. He received a, a BA in Molecular Science from University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA in 1970, 
and a PhD in 1974 from Stanford University for research on DNA replication, working with Arthur Kornberg, the recipient of the 1959 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. After a two year postdoc at University of California, San Diego, he joined the faculty at the University of California, Berkeley in 1976. There he ascended through the ranks to earn a full professorship in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology in 1989. In 1990, he was appointed investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, a very prestigious position. He served as chair of the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Biology at Berkeley from, from 2002 to 2012. And in 2005, he founded and became the first director of UC Berkeley's Stem Cell Center. It would take me a long time to describe Dr. Shackman's accolades and accomplishments. In addition to the 2013 Nobel Prize, he received Canada's a 1996 Gardner International Award, the 2002 Albert Lasker Award in Basic Medical Research, and several other prominent awards, as well as eight honorary doctorates. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Phys Philosophical Society. He is a foreign associate of the Academia Nazionale del Lince, a foreign associate of the Royal Society of London, and an honorary academician of the Academia Sinica in China. In 1990, 1999, he was elected president of the American Society for Cell Biology. In 1999, from 99 to 2017, he served as editor-in-chief of the annual reviews of cell and developmental biology. From 2006 to 2011, he served as editor-in-chief of the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Shackman has been an influential proponent of a reform to current practice in academic journal publishing and has criticized the elitist approach of prestigious journals, journals such as Nature, Cell, and Science. To back his words with action, he served as the founding editor-in-chief from 2011 to 2019 of an innovative open access journal, eLife, which is sponsored by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Wellcome Trust, and the Max Planck Society. E-Life has become, thanks to his work, uh, one of the most prominent journals in the life and health sciences, a major promoter of the open science framework. Since 2018, Dr. Shackman turned his attention to the fight against Parkinson's disease. He's the scientific director of Aligning Science Across Parkinson's, ASAP, a research funding initiative that coordinates targeted basic research and resources to uncover the roots of Parkinson's disease. McGill owes a debt of gratitude to Dr. Shackman that goes beyond the enormity of his scientific contributions. He has been a generous guest lecturer to our department's course on best practices in biomedical research. Onco 620, our students love him. Um, uh, Dr. Shackman, we are delighted to have you as our distinguished lecturer. Our intention was to have this as an in-person event, but the pandemic circumstances prevented us from doing so. Dr. Shackman, by the way, he's on an extended Thanksgiving holiday in Germany, and was gracious enough to accept to give this lecture six hours ahead of Montreal time. It's almost 11 p.m. for where he is in Munich right now. So please write uh, your question, Dr. Shackman, at the special email we have for that at specialevent.med at mcgill.ca. Dr. Shackman, that's, we're all eager to, to hear you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dean Eidelman, uh, Dr. Franco, and colleagues in, in McGill, my friends in uh, Canada. I'm delighted to be here uh, to address you. Uh, I've decided for my lecture um, this evening, for where I am, uh, instead of giving a retrospective lecture on early work from my laboratory, uh, I'd like to focus on more recent work, which I think uh, you'll find of some interest and in, which bears, I believe, on issues of intercellular communication, particularly in normal physiologic processes, but also perhaps in disease. And, and that uh, Dr. Franco referred to as uh, um, relating to extracellular vesicles. So if I can begin by sharing my screen, um, let's uh, launch into this. So the lecture is, uh, uh, on uh, my life in, in the lab. And uh, uh, although my early career was devoted to studies on the mechanism of intracellular traffic in eukaryotic cells, for the last uh, eight or nine years, we focused our interest on extracellular vesicles. They are a branch uh, of the secretory pathway in at least one limb of this process. Extracellular vesicles form by budding 
from the cell surface by a process that may be analogous to the formation of, uh, of enveloped RNA viruses, such as coronavirus. Uh, they also are produced as a branch of the endocytic pathway, where proteins are internalized uh, in, into an early endosome, and very often uh, proteins that are de uh, um, de uh, going to be delivered to the lysosome for destruction are internalized further by invagination into the interior of the endosome to create an organelle that has been called the multivesicular body or multivesicular endosome. These, uh, for many years, were believed simply to be diverted to the lysosome where the internalized vesicle material was degraded. However, about uh, 20 years ago, uh, some fraction of these organelles were seen to fuse at the cell surface where they would deliver exosomes, uh, a subset of extracellular vesicles into the uh, cell exterior. Now, there's a great deal of discussion about what these exosomes may do. They could either be another form of disposal by the cell, or they may be taken up uh, by other cells for uh, physiologic processes. There's even some considerable evidence that exosomes may participate in disease processes. There's some evidence to support the possibility that exosomes arising from a primary tumor may migrate to a secondary tissue to develop a pre-metastatic niche into which the cells from a primary tumor may migrate to form a, met a metastasis. So there's a great deal of interest in exosomes uh, for their, uh, uh, their role in disease, for their potential therapeutic application, and uh, in, um, uh, in diagnostic purposes. Uh, for some years, we focused uh, primarily on understanding uh, the, the diversity of vesicles that are secreted by mammalian cells grown in culture. And I summarized just one part of our work here with a, an image from a fractionation developed by a former graduate student in my lab, uh, Moraima Tomosh Diaz, who found that this particular cell line, about which I'll have more to say later, called MB231, a breast cancer cell line, uh, produces vesicles that can be resolved on a buoyant density gradient into two populations, a low buoyant density population marked by a subset of membrane markers and a higher buoyant density fraction uh, characterized principally by a unique co composition of a four-spanning membrane protein called CD63, about which I'll have more to say later. Um, we showed and published several years ago that these high buoyant density vesicles are likely exosomes and they contain, unlike their low buoyant density partners, they contain a very highly selected set of microRNAs, some uh, more than a thousand fold enriched in these vesicles. Now, what these vesicles are doing with this subset of microRNAs remains to be seen, but there is nonetheless a very active uh, sorting apparatus that we've been studying biochemically in the lab that allows certain microRNAs to be segregated. Now, I'm going to very briefly summarize some work that was published uh, several months ago in the Journal of Cell Biology that relates to one particular study that we've uh, done recently to characterize extracellular vesicles that are produced by differentiating neurons. And these, this is work that was conducted by a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Lu Song. Lu, Lu's graduate work in Shanghai was devoted to understanding the, the process of differentiation of mouse embryonic stem cells as they progress to neural progenitor cells. And uh, she wanted, when she joined my lab, to ask whether such cells, as they differentiate, may produce vesicles uh, from, uh, from, uh, um, from axons, from, uh, from dendrites, or possibly from the cell body. And if during the course of this differentiation, the vesicles so produced may have an influence on neighboring cells. So uh, I can't tell you uh, in any depth about the work, but let me summarize what she discovered, which we think is really quite interesting and, and, and may be important. Using the cell lines that can be differentiated in vitro, such as PC12 cells differentiated with nerve growth factor, or N2A cells, a mouse neuroblastoma cell line that can be differentiated into neural progenitor cells uh, by treatment with retinoic acid, or indeed with mouse embryonic stem cells themselves, she showed that during the formation of neural progenitor cells, these cells produce a, uh, a, a, an abundant uh, uh, source of extracellular vesicles that are highly enriched in a cell cycle regulatory protein, CD, uh, 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 um, 
CDC is cyclin D1 and its cognate uh, kinase, CDK4. And further, she showed that these vesicles so enriched in cyclin D1, when mixed with naive mouse embryonic stem cells, will promote their differentiation at a greater pace into neural progenitor cells, dependent upon the introduction of cyclin D1 from the vesicles into the cytoplasm and then into the nucleus of uh, differentiating mouse embryonic stem cells. So we're very interested in this, and we have, at least in this one instance, uh, a clear-cut example of the selective capture of proteins into an extracellular vesicle and their functional delivery into a target cell. Now, armed with the, the, the suggestion that such vesicles may be able to deliver something to a target cell, another postdoctoral fellow in my lab who joined my lab most, more recently uh, by the name of Songyan Zhang decided to try to engineer the incorporation of genome editing functions such as Cas9 and a guide RNA into a donor cell, in this case, a donor cell called HEC293, to see if it could be functionally delivered to a target cell, for instance, this breast cancer cell line that I told you about a moment ago. So Tsongyan is a very, uh, a very active and engaged postdoctoral fellow, so much so that in the course of recent experiments, uh, he uh, slipped and sprained his knee and was uh, still so motivated to continue his work that he would sit at the bench with um, his, his um, ankle packed in ice and continue to do the biochemical assays about which I'll describe in a moment. So here was the strategy that Song Yan and I devised to enrich Cas9 and a guide RNA into exosomes secreted from HEC293 cells. The idea is simple. It relies on a technique that has been used to synchronize the process of secretion in cultured mammalian cells. Uh, the, the, the trick was simply to uh, tether Cas9 to CD63, to a, C, uh, to, uh, to, the, to a domain of CD63 that is presented to the cytoplasm on the surface of an endosome where the protein strept avidin had been fused uh, to the C terminus of CD63 and another protein, strept avidin binding protein, fused to Cas9. Now we know from the literature that strept avidin binding protein interacts with strept avidin, uh, but the two are tethered in a way that can be reversed by addition of biotin. So in a normal cell then, HEC293 cells, expressing these two fusion proteins, Cas9 and its bound guide RNA expressed, expressed in these cells would adhere to streptavidin CD63. And as we know that CD63 is highly enriched, sorted into uh, intraluminal vesicles that accumulate in a multivesicular body, we would expect to be able to similarly enrich Cas9 and guide RNA into these vesicles, which um, on fusion of the multivesicular body at the cell surface would release exosomes to the cell exterior that had a, an enriched form of Cas9 and, uh, and uh, uh, that would be uh, enriched but reversed on addition of biotin. So let me show you two um, characterization experiments that reveal that this was so. The first experiment was simply to isolate uh, exosomes secreted by HEC293 cells uh, by sedimentation uh, at high speed to a pellet fraction, followed by flotation on a sucrose buoyant density uh, gradient. Uh, the vesicles equilibrate at the interface between 40 and 10% sucrose. And in uh, two control experiments, Song Yan showed that Cas9 expressed by itself without adherent, without um, binding at all to CD63, is a very poorly, if at all, detected in the isolated vesicles. So his, his tag Cas9 or strept avidin tag Cas9 expressed without the CD63 fusion protein is not detected in the vesicles. On the other hand, when both fusion proteins, the Cas9 fusion and the CD63 fusion are expressed together, two different markers show significant enrichment of Cas9 in the vesicles. Now on the RNA side, when the guide RNA is expressed in these cells, uh, very little if any guide RNA is detected in cells that are expressing Cas9 untethered to CD63. On the other hand, when the two fusion proteins are expressed together, um, the guide RNA is highly enriched, uh, as you see, a 
fold enrichment uh, dependent upon adherence of Cas9 to the CD63. And another characterization experiment, Tsongyan was able to show that the Cas9 protein and the guide RNA are sequestered in the interior of the, of the isolated exosome. This is established by two very simple experiments. In panel A, the uh, vesicles that were isolated were exposed to proteinase K in the uh, absence uh, or the presence of detergent, Triton X100. In the absence of the detergent, the Cas9 is perfectly protected. It's resistant because it's sequestered in the interior along with other proteins that, are, that mark the uh, exosome membrane. Whereas if detergent is added, all of the proteins are degraded. So that establishes Cas9 is inside of the vesicle. Likewise, using uh, nuclease rather than proteinase K, Songyan was able to show that the guide RNA is protected against exogenous nuclease unless the vesicles are suspended in the presence of nuclease and a detergent. So having established enrichment and sequestration of Cas9 and guide RNA in the vesicle, Songyan um, then had to set out to develop a reporter cell line that would sensitively detect the uptake and functional delivery of Cas9 into the target cell. So he did this in the following way, he developed a very sensitive reporter that consists of several parts. And let me explain um, the cassette that he constructed. The cassette consists of two genes uh, that encode the enzyme luciferase. One is firefly luciferase, and a, another is a, another smaller protein called NLUC, N luciferase, the two luciferases have different substrate specificities and can thus be distinguished uh, by distinct biochemical assays. Uh, they are expressed, uh, they, are, uh, they are linked together on this cassette through a peptide that is a self-cleaving peptide that would separate the f loop from the n loop in the case that the n loop is expressed. However, interposed between uh, n loop uh, and the, and, and the self-cleaving peptide, he introduced a, um, not only a Cas9 target for the guide RNA, but a stop codon and a single nucleotide frame shift mutation, both of which would have to be edited out for the end loop to be seen and expressed. And so, as you can see in the cartoon, if the Cas9 and its guide RNA are present uh, and can uh, perform the editing function, both F loop and end loop would be expressed and then separated from one another by the self-cleaving peptide. To demonstrate that this works, he showed that when uh, Cas9 and one or another of two different guide RNAs are expressed in the reporter cell, uh, there is a tremendous increase in the ratio of expression of the enzyme n loop over f loop. However, um, in the absence of the guide RNA, no such expression is seen. So this is a good signal to noise ratio. All right, having now established a donor cell line with enriched Cas9 and guide RNA and a very sensitive reporter cell line, uh, the next obvious uh, exciting question was, can we isolate these exosomes, mix them with the reporter cell line, in this case, the breast cancer cell line, MB231, and see uh, a signal attributable to the delivery of Cas9? Well, the results at first were rather disappointing. Let me show you some of our initial results. Um, when the Cas9 and guide RNA are expressed in the recipient cell, uh, a striking increase in the ratio of n loop to f loop is seen, as I showed you in the previous slide. However, when exosomes are mixed with the receptor cell line, even at a ratio of 100,000 exosomes to per cell, uh, Xiangyan observed only a, a minor 50% increase in the ratio of n loop to f loop. Nonetheless, this signal, though it's uh, fairly uh, moderate, is, um, responds in a dose-dependent manner. At a lower level of vesicles, we see a signal. It rises a bit as the ratio of vesicles increases. So this was disappointing. We wonder, what, why is the signal so weak? We know that the Cas9 uh, is functional inside of the vesicle. We've independently measured that. What's going on? There were two possibilities that Song Yan considered. One was possibly the vesicles didn't survive during the buoyant density gradient separation procedure. Perhaps they're damaged by the procedure. Or, or perhaps the vesicles are simply 
very uh, ephemeral. They need to be consumed at the point of secretion and taken up immediately. He tested that in two ways. In the first way, we simply took condition medium in which the HEC2 and A3 cells were grown over the course of several days and without any fractionation, mixed the uh, supernatant fraction with the, um, uh, the acceptor cell. And uh, after three days saw no increase in signal. After eight days, we saw perhaps a twofold, still a marginal increase in the ratio of N loop to F loop. So again, fairly disappointing. The second, and I think even more uh, remarkable result, is uh, he grew the two cells in a uh, transwell chamber where the uh, recipient cell uh, and donor cells were separated by a, a, a vesicle permeable membrane, but the cells were otherwise in communication, at least by vesicular flow. And yet, during the course of six days of co-culture in this chamber, no increase in the signal of uh, n loop to f loop was seen. So this was, this was, of course, rather disappointing, I have to say. Uh, but um, we considered one more possibility, and that was what happens if you simply co-culture the cells together with no impediment, allowing cell-cell contact to see if transfer could occur. And of course, I'm telling you this because that we, saw, we got quite a striking result when the co-culture was done uh, to uh, near confluence. Uh, HEC-23 cells by themselves, when uh, serving both as the donor and as the acceptor, fail to communicate, even when mixed in co-culture with direct contact. On the other hand, when HEC-23 cells serving as the donor are mixed with a number of different cell lines, most of which are uh, uh, tumor cell lines, uh, and most dramatically with MB231, incubated with or without biotin to separate Cas9 from its bound form to CD63, Songyan observes a 60-fold uh, increase in the ratio of N loop to F loop. So a very dramatic effect, um, not for some reason working with HeLa cells as an acceptor, but working very well with other transformed cell lines. Now, let me emphasize one interesting feature about this, and that is the, the transfer of material between cells appears to be asymmetric because HEC-293 cells, though they serve as a very active donor, fail um, uh, completely in serving as an acceptor whereas MB231 cells appear to serve as, a, as an acceptor, but in other experiments, they can also serve as a donor. So there's some asymmetric um, contribution of perhaps of cell surface proteins to this form of communication. <clears throat> now, what could this form of communication be? Well, we immediately turned to the literature and realized that there was in fact a 20 year experience with a form of communication that at least can be seen in cell culture. And that is through the uh, extension of tubules from a donor cell, making contact and fusing with the surface of, a, of, a, of, of an acceptor cell to form structures that have been called tunneling nanotubes. These structures can be very thin uh, on the order of 100 nanometers, or they can be very thick on the order of one to two microns in diameter. They can form contacts that uh, remain closed ended without membrane fusion. Uh, uh, where a tubule tethers and forms perhaps a tight junction to a target cell, or, or they can form a complete cytoplasmic continuity, that, a process that will require membrane fusion. Now it's known from the literature that these tubular connections uh, can be seen uh, and can uh, be observed to transmit uh, particles, uh, proteins, protein aggregates, even organelles like mitochondria can pass back and forth between these cytoplasmic connections. The cytoplasmic connections are formed and stabilized by actin filaments. If, they are, if these actin filaments are depolymerized, then the uh, cytoplasmic transfer is blocked. And indeed in uh, Songyan's assay, uh, latrunculin, which uh, depolymerizes actin, completely eliminates the transfer. He showed in other experiments that I don't have time to tell you that receptor-mediated endocytosis appears not to be required for this process if proteins are, uh, that are required for that are knocked down or if drugs are administered that block endocytosis, there is uh, little diminishment in the transfer between cells. So uh, let's have a look then at some of the images that uh, Tsiongyan was able to uh, uh, obtain to, to observe this transfer in uh, real time. 
Now in the setup that he used to visualize this process, the donor cell can be seen by its content of GFP tag Cas9. So that's the visual marker. It is uh, an overwhelming signal that you can see in these donor cells. Uh, the cells uh, that serve as acceptors are not expressing Cas9 or GFP. Uh, they are uh, independently marked by the addition of a fluorescently tagged form of wheat germ agglutinin, which binds to the surface of the cell, <clears throat> is internalized into endosomes and ultimately into the lysosome and can be seen uh, marking the surface of these uh, acceptor cells. And so occasionally, not, uh, not too frequently, Song Yin was able to observe a connection. And as you'll see in a higher magnification image, the connection appears to be a, uh, a, a functional uh, fusion junction that permits at least initially one, to, one seeing transfer, we, we believe in both directions through this junction. Now in looking at an example in, um, in, in, in real time, although it's sped up for this image, um, you can see in this video, the contact initially being made, you can imagine that you're looking up at the top of the Sistine Chapel and you see uh, God extending his arm to touch Adam, uh, as you see in this image of this uh, tubular connection being made between the donor and acceptor cell with some material beginning to flow back and forth. Now, um, this connection, as I told you, uh, requires an asymmetric comp contribution of HEC293 and MB231 cells. If Tsongyan set up the donor acceptor pair to being exclusively HEC2 and A3, serving both as the donor and the acceptor, one sees these junctions form uh, and they remain very stable and can persist for several hours with little or no evidence of any fusion uh, permitting intercytoplasmic uh, transfer. So over in, this, in this particular experiment, the connection was enormously stable. Several hours later, there still appeared to be little of any transmission between the cells. So there's something missing, we believe, on the surface of the HEC2 NA3 cell that would allow a tubular connection to resolve by membrane fusion. Now, uh, among the various experiments that he's been conducting recently, there's one that's particularly interesting to us. And that is, um, he's been able to see a role for a protein called uh, Dynamin. Dynamin is a protein that has been shown to play a role in receptor-mediated endocytosis by pinching endocytic vesicles at the neck to sever the vesicle uh, by a process of fission uh, to allow the endocytic vesicle to be internalized. Now, dynamin also plays other roles in the cell. It's not only involved in endocytosis, it's also involved in exocytosis by pinching a vesicle that's budding from the trans-Golgi apparatus. So in this experiment, what Song Yan observed is, was really quite surprising to us when uh, the, um, the donor cell was uh, uh, subjected to an siRNA knockdown of the Dynamin 2 paralog, only about a, a, a marginal, maybe 50% decrease in the transmission of uh, Cas9 from the donor cell to the acceptor cell is seen. However, when the... Um, the acceptor cell, when the reporter cell is knocked down for Dynamin 2, a rather striking diminished transfer of Cas9 is observed, uh, over 90% efficient blocking dependent on knockdown, specifically in the acceptor cell rather than the donor cell. Now, the images uh, of, the, of this particular setup where Cas9 is being transmitted from donor to acceptor showed just as I showed you a moment ago that the junction that forms in this example is an adhesion between a tubule emanating from the donor cell, but failing to fuse with the acceptor cell. And again, over a very long period of time, such connections can be seen. There's clearly some uh, adhesion, uh, but it fails uh, to resolve by membrane fusion. So we think from these uh, experiments and <clears throat> many more that are being conducted now, that there is a very active engagement in an asymmetric process where a donor cell extends a tubule, makes contact with an acceptor cell, and if the acceptor cell is provisioned, perhaps with a fusogen molecule uh, that perhaps required dynamin for its delivery from the Golgi apparatus to the cell surface, that that cell will then uh, promote membrane fusion and allow transfer to occur.
So let me summarize <clears throat> the evidence that I presented to you uh, this afternoon, this evening. Um, we've shown that uh, uh, Cas9 can be tethered to CD63 and it may be released into the cytoplasm of a donor cell or travel along with an endosome through a tubular connection whose formation and stability requires an actin filament uh, displaying across the boundary between the cells. The, uh, there is an obvious uh, tethering event. There's uh, that tethering event likely resolves by some membrane fusion dependent on a fusogen that we're trying to identify. We think that such a molecule may arise by exocytosis in a dynamic dependent manner uh, where it is delivered <clears throat> to the plasma membrane of the acceptor cell and allows these two membranes to join. We're very excited about these new and really quite unexpected results. <clears throat> we have some evidence for the nature of the fusogen molecule, but, uh, but I'm even more excited by the prospect of conducting a screen for all of the genes that will require, be required for this intracellular communication. We think that, <clears throat> that uh, Song Yan's reporter assay will provide us with a tool that can be used in an RNAi screen to look for all the other proteins required for this form of communication. So let me summarize uh, by um, showing you the group at our recent thanks uh, at our recent uh, Halloween party on the roof of our building. We have a festive group dressed up for the occasion. Um, and uh, this is uh, Tsong Yan, whose work I've described. And this is me dressed up as Donald Trump. So thank you for your attention. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shekman. This this has been terrific and quite a nice group at the end. You know, very uh, very active and uh, uh, convivial. Um, there is a there is a, a lag between the lecture and uh, what's going on in YouTube, so it uh, there is uh, still some time for questions to to come up. But let me let me ask you, uh, Dr. Shekman, for you to speculate. I mean, if you could uh, allow yourself to. Uh, to uh, think along the lines of translation. And I know you're, you're very keen on uh, Parkinson's research and you showed the intercellular communication, which would be a, a very important element here in, in all the Parkinson's. And of course, you're speaking to an audience of oncologists and cancer, cancer researchers as well. So if you could go unplugged and eventually to well, speculate. Happy to Happy to speculate on all those things. First of all, the connection to cancer uh, is, is interesting because as I pointed out, the, the cell lines that serve very most actively as acceptor cell lines are, are um, tumor cell lines. Uh, whereas an, a non-transformed cell line, HEC-283, um, uh, cannot serve as, a, as an acceptor, it can serve as a donor. So it may be that tumors, uh, tumors uh, may communicate with neighboring cells by this process of tubular connection and sustain themselves in that way. So we're very interested in whether this process actually works in a, in a, in a real tumor. And we're going to begin some animal experiments um, in the next year to see if, uh, if this process is, is relevant to um, maintaining the transformed state in, a, in, a, in an animal. But that's uh, still just a conjecture. Now, in, in relation to Parkinson's disease, not a subject that I haven't addressed directly, we're also very interested in the possibility that this uh, tubular communication between cells may be the means by which a, an aggregation-prone protein, such as alpha-synuclein, may be transmitted uh, in the brain. So there's evidence that uh, alpha-synuclein, which is a subunit of uh, the structure called the Lewy body, which is a pathological hallmark of uh, Parkinson's disease and is believed to spread in the brain of patients who are afflicted with the disease. Uh, there is uh, some evidence that um, alpha-synuclein may be transmitted from cell to cell, but uh, unfortunately the evidence about the means by which this transmission occurs is, has, not been, uh, has not been clarified. Uh, it, it may be secreted unconventionally and taken up by a target cell. Uh, it may be secreted in an exosome and taken up by endocytosis. Or uh, I think more interestingly for us, it may be communicated by these uh, eph eph ephemeral tubular connections between nerve cells. So I have a, a brand new graduate student who's uh, trying to set this up using fully differentiated uh, neurons uh, that express a, an aggregation prone form of alpha synuclein to see if that transmission can occur dependent on cell-cell contact. So I think there are many pathological uh, 
issues that relate to what we've observed. Um, but we're also still interested in seeing how we could might be able to use what we're learning to provision exosomes with the apparatus that would allow them to deliver editing functions. So that's another line of investigation that we're conducting. Exciting days ahead, indeed. Uh, we, uh, Dean Eidelman has a question, if uh, Dean Eidelman could ask. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Schechtman, for that uh, fantastic talk and very, very exciting uh, uh, ideas. I have a, a, an, out, an out there question. <clears throat> To some extent, the cell to cell transfer of material was, is reminiscent of what you see in bacteria, where you see exchange of genetic material. Mm -hmm. Is this the same mechanism, or is this a mechanism? This is a, is, is this a, uh, a eukaryotic mechanism only? No. Well, um, when bacteria transmit genetic information, it's usually through a non membranous structure, a flagellum uh, making contact with a with the target cell. Um, uh, on the other hand, bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, particularly pathogenic forms of gram-negative bacteria, produce vesicles by blebbing from the outer membrane. And it's believed that these kinds of vesicles may convey uh, toxins from uh, bacteria to other cells. Or it may even be that uh, in Parkinson's disease, there's some evidence for a role for the microbiome in the gut in the initiation of the pathology that may progress from, uh, from the intestine through uh, yeah, the vagus nerve up to the brain. And so uh, it, it may be that, that bacteria are initiating this process by budding vesicles that are captured by, uh, by, epithelial, by, by human epithelial cells. So that form of communication between bacteria and, uh, and the host may, may actually be something, but there really hasn't been anybody to investigate that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shekman, I have two technical questions here that are coming through the chat line here from those who attended. And they, they come from uh, some basic science colleagues of ours. So the first one is from Dr. Jerry Peltier. Do you think transport of Cas9 mRNA across the nanotube may also be contributing to the editing, uh, uh, the editing events in the recipient cell? Yeah, right. There's nothing that we've done that distinguishes Cas9 protein versus Cas9 message uh, responsible for that uh, for that event. That's a, a, a fair question, uh, we, one that we probably could answer, but we haven't we haven't done so. So far, these experiments have been done by one terrific postdoc. Thank you, and I have another one for you coming from Dr. Stefan Richard. Do you think engineering the lipid content of your Cas9 exosomes will make them more efficient? for cell transmission. Yeah, um, that's always possible. Um, I wouldn't know where to begin to do that. My hope is the following. Um, there's a protein that we've identified that others have suggested has a role in fusion. It's called a, it's a protein called syncytin. It's a relative of, of a, a retroviral fusion protein. And it was uh, taken up by the mammalian genome some tens of millions of years ago. Uh, it plays a role in, in normal uh, fetal development at the very early trophoblast, trophoblast stage of, uh, of embryonic development. Um, and what its role is in, at that stage is, is, is not understood, and yet it's present in, in cells, and it's particularly interestingly present in tumor cells. It's more highly expressed in tumor cells. So here's our hope. Our hope is that if we ectopically express a form of syncytin in the donor cell in a, in a way that we can ensure that it's being packaged efficiently into exosomes, that perhaps those exosomes provisioned with syncytin could then deliver their content by fusion to a target cell. But that's, uh, that's just, so far, it's just a, a fantasy. But changing the lipid composition could, could help. I, I just wouldn't know where to begin. Yeah, exciting days ahead indeed. As you as you as you learn, you and your colleagues learn how to play with the cargo and efficiently deliver that cargo and eventually mediate yeah. uh, modulate all these processes. Yeah. Um, I don't see any more questions here coming to the through the chat, um, except uh, an interesting odd question here about the, why you chose to address as Donald Trump in that final picture there with her group. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it was, it was, you know, you're supposed to scare people on Halloween. So that's what I thought I would do. There you go. That, yeah, <laughs> that would have done, certainly attained your, your objective there. Um, well, uh, this, this has been a terrific, uh, terrific, terrific lecture. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Sheckman. I greatly appreciate it, you honoring us with this opportunity, being our distinguished speaker in 2021. And uh, you so well deserve going, going back to your Thanksgiving holidays now. And uh, we, 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 we thank you very much and safe travels and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Franco. And, and congratulations to the honorees uh, this evening. Thank you. Goodbye. So, well, so continue on uh, with our with our event. You know, after this extraordinary uh, uh, opportunity to hear from Dr. Shackman, uh, Nobel Prize recipient, and someone who has uh, given so much to the cause of uh, cell biology and, and cancer research, would like to. Uh, move on to the awards part of our ceremony, which is segmented. We have two parts, actually three parts. Uh, the initial part is the introduction to the co-op award recipients. And uh, just to give you as, by, uh, as background, every other year we, we have the privilege of recognizing graduate students with these uh, co-op fellowships. The co-op endowment was established to fulfill McGill University's mandate of academic excellence by supporting graduate training opportunities in research domains that would be relevant to the Rossi Cancer Network. Uh, it was established in 2012 by Chi Kun Ho Kwok, a 1973 graduate of McGill to honor the memory of his father, Mr. Philip Kwok. So this opportunity is open to active McGill University graduate students pursuing research work that is directly linked to the, to the Rossi Cancer Network's mandate of cancer care quality improvement across the continuum from diagnosis to survivorship. They include aspects of care delivery, patient experience, management and prevention of adverse events and survivorship improvement. The selection process is via detailed assessment of candidates proposals for scientific, scientific excellence and fitness to the overall goals of the Rossi Cancer Network. Members of the Departmental Awards Committee score proposals and the top candidates are selected to receive the fellowships. We have four fellowship recipients in 2021, two in the category of master's degrees and two in the category of PhD degrees. So let's move on to see the slides on the Quark fellowships. And so that I may uh, present to you each one of these brilliant students. And let's start with Justine Albert. Uh, she is an MSc candidate and her project is on palliative and end of life experiences among English speaking informal caregivers in Quebec. She's supervised by one of her faculty members, Dr. Carmen Loisel, as you can see Justine here and uh, a, a picture of the, of the actual award that she's going to be receiving shortly as part of this ceremony. So moving on to the next one, Nicole, no, the one before that please, Nicole Anderson. Uh, uh, Master of Arts candidate, and uh, her project is on evaluating the greatest impacts on health-related quality of life in soft tissue sarcoma patients. She has the honor of being co-supervised with Dr. Robert Turcot and Dr. Annette Corner, both uh, uh, faculty members of our department, and you see the award for Nicole. Congratulations, Nicole, as well. Next one. Maria Doris Duranapolitano, the first of our two PhD candidate re candidates receiving this award, and her project is on the impact of diagnosis to treatment intervals on head and neck cancer patients. A very timely story right now because of the COVID. We need to know what the impact of these treatment intervals in terms of the outcome that they experience. She is supervised by two faculty members. Dr. Belinda Nicolau and Dr. Jay Kaufman, two epidemiologists, uh, terrific epidemiologists in our department, as well as in the School of Population and Global Health and Faculty of Dentistry. Next one. And uh, that's Renata Iskander, PhD candidate, and her projects on patient burden in drug development, an empiric and normative investigation. And she's supervised by Dr. Jonathan, Jonathan Kimmelman. Uh, one of our champions in ethics research and understanding of biomedical ethics. And uh, clearly Renata's project is 
is going to be a very, a very useful one in general. So congratulations to all the uh, recipients of the Quark Fellowship. And uh, we have the awards ready for them. So hopefully they'll come here and we'll have a, a picture opportunity with each one of them uh, to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to celebrate their, their, their awards. So congratulations to all the Quark recipients. And with that, we move to the other segment, which is the, our merit awards for, uh, for departmental staff and uh, faculty and staff. And uh, we have been doing this since 2011. And we once again take the opportunity in 2021 to recognize our oncology heroes, as I call them. This next segment is for the recurring annual merit awards. A standing awards committee, which is a superset of the, the previous one that I mentioned to you, representing all the segments of our oncology community, uh, from basic science to clinical population health research, and also representative of the various uh, hospital and, and, and sites where research and teaching is conducted across the McGill Oncology community. So this standing awards committee selects the recipients from several nominees. It's a very competitive process and departmental members and staff submit these nominations. The Merit Awards also recognize the nominators uh, because they're devoted McGill members who selfishly put their effort in persuasion to demonstrate the excellence of the work performed by their peers. So the Merit Awards are in four categories. In fact, we're beginning a fourth category this year. It used to be in three categories until last year. So the first category is in academic, clinical, and research support. The second one is on clinical service and innovation. Third one is on teaching and mentorship. And the fourth one on research. In addition to the trophies that I will show while the citations are read, their names will be engraved in a framed gallery at the entrance of the departmental headquarters right here in this, in this uh, site. The trophies will be sent to the recipients after each ceremony. So let's move on with the, the first merit, merit award the recipient, Mrs. Tatiana Nisik in the category of academic, clinical, and research support. And she was nominated by Dr. Jan Sointes, who now read the citation. So good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, I'm glad to read the citation. So Tatiana joined our department in Department of Medical Physics in uh, 2005, an administrative officer. And she became responsible for clinical administration, purchasing and support of clinical medical physics. When I became director of MPU in 2009, uh, she became much more involved in the academic and research activities by MPU and took up a position of uh, research, played a role of research coordinator. And this um, was uh, really uh, emphasized uh, in 2013 when we uh, received the CREATE program where she took a major role in helping administering the CREATE program. Uh, uh, which brought uh, $2 million to McGill for uh, research training for research training of medical physicists. And as a coordinator of the program, she was responsible for administration. Within that, she supported over 100 professional and technical training courses, kept track of hundreds of students and fellows. She's been instrumental in all of the program reporting, which if any of the people here know uh, are aware of NSER CREATE uh, programs represents a mammoth of contribution to the division. So, the success of this uh, CREATE program uh, was, was substantial with hundreds of papers published and thousands of citations. So most importantly, I think Tatiana has an attitude and stamina and depth to solve complex administrative issues. And when she, when she takes on a task, you can 100% count that it will be done to, uh, to perfection. And she's also very down to earth as a person. Um, she distinguishes quality and true contract from cos cosmetics and form. So as a nominator, I'm very glad to, to have nominated her and I'm glad that the uh, committee decided to extend the award to her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sunjens, Dr. Eidelman, Dr. Franco, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored to be receiving the Gerald Bronfen Oncology Departmental Award today. I am earnestly grateful to Professor Jan Sunjens for this nomination. Also, I would like to say that it has always been an honor and pleasure for me to work within the research 
grants and clinical tasks with Dr. Sunjans and all the professors, doctors, researchers, physicists, and colleagues from McGill University and McGill University Health Center. I sincerely thank each one of you who supported my nomination. Thank you. It is all yours, Tatiana. It's coming your way. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you, Dr. <laughs> Franco. Now, moving on, uh, thank you very much, Tatiana. Let's move on now to the second merit award uh, given to Dr. Manuel Borod. He won in the category of clinical service and innovation. His nominator is Dr. Armin Aprikian, who will now read his citation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Franco. Um, it's truly a pleasure and honor uh, for me to have uh, nominated um, Dr. Borod, not just by myself, but um, truly, uh, truly support from everyone within our network uh, who uh, appreciates very much Dr. Borod's um, service to our community. Um, Manny graduated uh, from medical school from McGill in 1972. He did a family medicine training, uh, but in addition, he obtained an MBA uh, from Concordia and a master's in public health from uh, UCLA. Uh, over the last 20 years, he dedicated himself uh, to um, supportive and palliative care uh, at McGill. In 2002, he became the palliative care service chief at the Montreal General Hospital. In 2008, uh, when the units were merged, became the chief of uh, MUHC supportive and palliative care services. At the same time, he led the MUHC uh, team to the level four designation by the Programme Québécois de Cancerologie, the highest level uh, of designation possible. Under his leadership, uh, several support services and programs were developed, including the Interdisciplinary Cancer Pain Program, Cancer Rehabilitation and Nutrition Program, Lymphedema Program, Survivorship Program, Psychosocial Oncology, and the very innovative Cannabis Clinic. Um, the establishment of the Innovative Cancer Pain Program was a model for many other across uh, the country and was recognized in 2015 uh, with an innovation award uh, by the Programme Québécois de Cancerologie. He's been a tireless champion of early involvement of supportive care services in the trajectory of cancer patients. Moreover, he was very outspoken about the importance of palliative care in the end of life setting, reminding us that with proper support and symptom management, the need for medical aid in dying should be less. Despite this, he was asked to ensure that medical aid in dying was available and performed at the highest standards uh, in, our, in, our, in our hospital. Finally, his vision of creating an outpatient yet hospital-based supportive care center, housing these various programs integrated with the teaching and research activities in a unique environment will soon become reality in the Cedar Supportive Care Center at Place Vendôme. On the clinical side, Manny never says no to helping out, even in the most difficult clinical situations. He's an invaluable role model for his team, uh, students, residents, and other professionals across our network. I very much enjoyed working with him over the past many years at the MUHC and our, across the network. The entire team is indebted to him for his dedication to our patients. Congratulations, Manny. And I'm pleased that the award committee um, has selected you for this award. Well, thank you, Armin. Um, a little over 21 years ago, I was working as a general practitioner uh, in a small walk-in clinic in Hunsik. Well, if you would have told me that I'd be receiving an award today from the Department of Oncology at McGill, I would have say, said you were out of your mind. Uh, I, at that time, I walked into Anna Tower's office at the RVH and told her I was interested in a career change to palliative care. He was supported, offered me a position, and my training consisted of pointing me towards the ward and saying, Manny, half the ward now is under your care. Fortunately, though, at that time, there was a young family physician who just completed additional training in palliative care, Dr. Crystal Lawler, who became my mentor. I didn't know it at the time, but it became evident in the years that followed that she was the most extraordinary palliative care. In addition to Krista, I worked with an incredible multidisciplinary team Deanne Lebeau, the assistant head nurse, Rosemary O'Grady, the nurse manager for palliative care, all the nurses on the ward, exceptional psychologists, Joanne de Montigny and Mark Lamel, 
Deborah Salmon of Pioneer in Music Therapy, wonderful nurses on our consult service, including Natalie Aubin, Suzanne Bless, and Lorraine Brown. There were social workers, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, pharmacists, and of course, the exceptional volunteers, including my wife, Diana, and our dog, Grace. These volunteers make palliative care so special. When people would comment to me on how difficult it was to practice palliative care, I would say nothing is more difficult than do, being a general practitioner in the community. I have many people to thank, including Stephanie Gingra, our CTU director, Antonio Vigano for all the work he has done in cancer rehab, cancer cachexia, and cannabis, all supported generously by the Cedars Cancer Foundation. And a special thanks to Yoram Shear, who founded the Cancer Pain Clinic with me, and to Jordi Perez, uh, the current director, and a special thanks to the Louise and Alan Edwards Foundation for their support. Finally, Armin, uh, thanks to you and, and Christine Bouchard for the incredible leadership you provide uh, to our cancer care mission. Uh, it's been a joy working with you. Um, every year at the end of our MUHC cancer mission retreats, I would raise my hand. Uh, Armin would cringe and I would congratulate everybody for all the efforts they have made to improve cancer care, but remind everyone that uh, many patients don't do well, suffer and die as a result of their disease. Uh, honoring me today is a recognition of all the work that we do in palliative care to improve the quality of the lives of our patients and uh, enable them to have a dignified and, and full death. Thank you very much to all of you for this award. Thank you. Let's let's take a, 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 minute, a second here or two to uh, have a photo op. Someone is going to be taking a snapshot of, uh, of the screen here. All right, I think that's that's good. So congratulations, Dr. Mano Borat. Now, <clears throat> the third merit award is given to Dr. Cristiano Ferrario, and in the category of teaching and mentorship, he was nominated by Dr. Victoria Mandilaris, who now read his citation. Thank you, Dr. Franco. I'm so pleased to have nominated Dr. Cristiano Ferrario, um, the winner of the Teaching and Mentorship Award. Dr. Ferrario completed his oncology training at the University of Milan and made his way to Montreal to pursue a clinical research fellowship at the Jewish General Hospital. And he loved Montreal so much that he decided to stay and has made a very successful career for himself here. Dr. Ferrario has been principal investigator on countless trials. He runs a very busy practice, but what is the most admirable is that he still makes time to mentor and teach our young trainees. I myself first met Dr. Ferrario as a resident and can attest to the major contributions that he makes to medical education. More recently, Dr. Ferrario has undertaken the important work of leading the medical oncology residency program transition into the competence by design curriculum. He also serves as chair of our competence committee while juggling his innumerable other commitments. But his dedication to oncology education does not stop there. His contributions to deepening oncology knowledge in the community are also many. His lectures have helped to empower a new generation of, on of oncologists working outside of academic centers and serve to continue a tradition of excellence in the medical oncology world. I cannot think of a more worthy recipient for this award. Congratulations, Cristiano. I'd now like to invite him to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Eduardo and the Dean. Uh, it's been, uh, I'm I've been really moved by this uh, nomination and this award. Um, I don't I consider myself much of a, <laughs> of a of a of a teacher, but I guess I'm someone who is really humbled and uh, feels privileged of doing a work that uh, you know every day mm, is is much greater than than ourselves, right? And so sharing the passion that for what I do um, is probably what uh, what can be the most useful also for our trainees who also you know keep me young and up to speed on a day to day basis. So um, I'm really I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I'm really happy to be part of this team. Um, I want to thank, uh, obviously, a few people. I need to thank my parents. I'm sorry, I'm Italian. I need to thank my parents. Uh, that's obvious. It comes without saying. Also, my parents are both teachers, right? So this is probably the award that would be the most uh, <laughs> proud of. They don't understand publications in New England, but this comes speaks to their heart. And I want to thank Dr. Panashi for being my um, greatest mentor, uh, lifelong, um, and also a, a great friend and sometimes also a great enemy. And I want to thank also all the residents, past, 
current, uh, as I said, for their, because their enthusiasm and their curiosity keeps me also um, every day, you know, more and more aware of the beauty of the job we do. And thanks to Victoria also for this um, surprising nomination and for all the dedication that you put into the program. Thank you very much, everyone. Congratulations. So let's just uh, take a couple of seconds for the, uh, the photo. Okay, well, congratulations, Cristiano. Now with that, uh, last but not least, the fourth one, the fourth merit award in the category of research. And that goes to Dr. Lucy Gilbert. She was nominated by Dr. Luis Suami, who now read the citation. Pleasure to introduce Dr. Lucy Gilbert to you, who has been awarded the Gerald Bronfman Department of Oncology Research uh, Merit Award. Before I present Dr. Gilbert, I would like to mention that her nomination was conjoint conjointly done with Dr. Claudia Martins. Dr. Gilbert joined McGill in 2001 with the tough mandate of developing within the gynecological oncology division, a dedicated research unit for gynecological cancer and to bring new and innovative clinical and technical channels, things that were missing at the time. My time is really short to describe all her achievements since her arrival. However, I would like to mention just a few to show how incredible and resourceful she is. Lucy set up the Women's Health Research Unit for Gynecological Cancer at the MUHC, a very active program in multinational clinical trials investigating novel precision therapies for gynecological cancer. This is a program, mind you, that attracts funding of more than 3.5 million yearly. She developed the very, very successful DOVE program in early detection of ovarian and endometrial cancer, a CHR-funded program. Moreover, given the very positive outcome of the original DOVE program, it has now been expanded to a phase three trial studying the potential value of a novel genomic intrauterine pap test for early detection of ovarian and endometrial cancer. Again, this is a study funded by the Canada's Genomic Application Partnership Program. Lucy has published over a hundred peer reviewed articles, has several book chapters to her credit and has been granted funding from many agencies nationally and from abroad, totaling more than $12 million. Dr. Miguel Bournier, who supported her nomination, mentioned in his letter quite accurately that her studies have enabled novel and earlier detection of disease that have already made and will continue to make a significant impact in patients' quality of life. Dr. Togas Tulandi, Chair of Obstetric and Gynecology, also supporting her nomination, mentioned that Lucy Gilbert's outstanding contribution to research in gynecological cancer is squarely aligned with the mission of the Gerald Bronfman Department of Oncology to improve quality of life of individuals with cancer throughout the disease trajectory through education, and public engagement, as well as research aimed to understand, prevent, treat, and cure the disease. I really salute the selection committee for choosing her for this award. 
it is my utmost pleasure to introduce Lucy Gilbert, awardee of the Research Merit Award. Thank you. Uh, Dean Eidelman, uh, Professor Franco, uh, colleagues, thank you so much for uh, giving, <laughs> recognizing me this way. Those of you who have uh, attended these ceremonies in the past will note that uh, Louis Suhami has nominated many people for many ca categories, particularly for research. And it's a testament to how much he values uh, research that he, as, Frank, as Dr. Franco said, continues to nominate people because he believes in research. And he has told me many times, and he has told others too, that if you are occupying space in a tertiary care university hospital, research is not an option. It's a fundamental obligation. So thank you, Louis, for instilling this into us. And thank you for being such a good role model. Uh, to the Department of Oncology, uh, Dean Eidelman uh, had mentioned what uh, Dr. Franco had achieved uh, during his tenure. Thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you for making what we do possible. Uh, for uniting us, for uh, uh, inspiring us and keeping us focused during what has been a rather difficult uh, two years. Um, and to, um, I, I have to say thank you to Armin because of the hospital part for making uh, research, as I said, it's difficult in a hospital setting to continue to do research. And it's important for uh, inspirational people like uh, Louis Armin to make this possible. So thank you to you, all of you, and to my colleagues for making it such a wonderful environment to work in. Thank you. Congratulations, Lucy. Let's all now freeze for a moment for a photo up. There you go. Congratulations, Lucy. This is coming your way. So congratulations to all four Merit Award recipients. Uh, your devotion to excellence is what makes McGill, the McGill Oncology community so special. And I'm so fond of this community to have, I have received the privilege to, uh, to chair. Now this brings us to the last segment of the award ceremony, which is the Lifetime Achievement Award. So last but not least, we'll give a Lifetime Achievement Award to a person selected by the Dean himself from a short list of candidates who have given decades of their lives to advance oncology education, research, or clinical practice at McGill nationally or and internationally. The winner this year is Dr. Brian Leland Jones, the Nightman himself who read the citation. Thank you, Eduardo. Born in a small village in Shropshire, some 11 miles from where Charles Darwin wrote The Voyage of the Beagle, Dr. Brian Leland Jones felt as early as the age of five that he wanted to contribute to transforming cancer therapy after seeing his next door neighbor being taken to hospital to have his leg amputated due to a case of lung cancer that had metastasized. He went on to obtain a BSc in biochemistry and a, uh, an MBBS from the University of London in the early 1970s. Then did a clinical fellowship at the Department of Medicine at New York Hospital and a medical oncology fellowship at Memorial Hospital in New York. In addition, he did a research fellowship at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And in 2004, he completed a PhD in molecular pharmacology from the University of London. In 1980, he became assistant attending physician at Memorial Hospital and clinical affiliate at the New York Hospital. He also held an academic appointment as an assistant professor in pharmacology at Cornell University. From 83 to 89, he held positions of attending consultant physician at the medical branch, med medicine branch of the National Institutes of Health and head of the developmental chemotherapy section at the Division of Cancer Treatment of the Investigational Drug Branch of the uh, National Cancer Institute in Bethesda. In 1989, he was recruited to McGill to serve as the inaugural chair of the newly created Department of Oncology 
A position he held between 1990 and 2000. As the inaugural Minda de Gunsberg Chair in Oncology, Dr. Leland Jones was responsible for taking the idea of a Department of Oncology and turning it into a fully functional and thriving unit within McGill. He built a critical mass of department faculty members, appointing both well-established and up-and-coming clinicians and cancer researchers, striving to make the department a unified body for cancer activities across McGill and its affiliated hospital, centralized oncology clinical trials, and paved the way for increased accrual, played a key role in the creation of several chairs and fellowships for the department. During this time, he was also a senior physician at the Montreal General, Royal Vic, and at St. Mary's. <clears throat> After completing two terms as department chair, Dr. Leland Jones remained at McGill as professor in the Departments of Oncology and Medicine until 2007, when he returned to the U.S. to serve as executive director of the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University School of Medicine. An, <clears throat> an associate vice president for health affairs at Woodruff Health Sciences in Atlanta. Other positions since leaving McGill include serving as the director of the Edith Sanford's Breast, Breast Cancer Research uh, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, professor in the Department of Internal Medicine, at the University of South Dakota, and vice president of molecular experimental medicine at Avera Cancer Institute in Sioux Falls. He currently holds several positions, including chief medical officer and board member of the National Foundation for Cancer Research, chief medical officer of OTRACES, chair of the scientific advisory board of NED Biosystems Incorporated, and chief medical officer of NOF1 Mission, chief scientific officer of the Darwin Foundation and director emeritus of the WIND Consortium. Dr. Leland Jones was the scientific founder and founding chairman CEO of Xanthus Life Sciences Incorporated and has served on many national and international committees and joint industry advisory boards. In addition, he's been editor in chief of two journals, the Journal of Cancer Control Research, as well as the Cancer Prevention and Control. And he has served on the editorial board of several other journals. His research is on the genetic and proteomic biomarkers of prognosis and prediction in breast cancer, pharmacogenetics, pharmacodynamics, and pharmacokinetics in oncology uh, clinical trials, and screening and mechanistic studies of novel, targeted, and chemotherapeutic anti-cancer agents. He submitted 35 patents and has received research funding from granting agencies as well as contracts from industry for clinical research studies. Over 450 invited lectures nationally and internationally and he has published 246 papers in peer-reviewed journals. For all that he has done to establish the foundations of what you can easily see as a thriving Department of Oncology at McGill and making sure that it would flourish as it did, and for all that he represents as a builder of cancer centers in North America, it's a privilege and a pleasure to give Dr. Brian Leland Jones the Gerald Bronfman Department of Oncology's Lifetime Achievement Award. Congratulations. Dean Eidelman. Thank you for that wonderful summary. Uh, it makes me feel 150 years old, but thank you so much. And thank you, Eduardo. I also wish to congratulate all the other awardees today. Many of those represent the future of where we're going. My wife and I are deeply grateful for you, for your nominations, for all of the colleagues who've supported this award. So I have spent the last blissful 10 years of my life with my wife, Melissa. I had an incredible childhood with my family in Shrewsbury, but McGill represented the unparalleled, transformative period in my life. I arrived on January the 14th, 1990, and I carried my mother up the stairs to the Chateau of Versailles because it had four feet of snow. I came into McGill the next day in order to receive my ID, and it ended in 007. And I thought, now I'm in heaven. I get 007 status on my first day. My colleagues were incredible. I'm going to keep my comments relatively brief, but just to mention some, Richard Margulies, Carolyn Freeman, Lou Suhami, who is on today, Mike Thurwell, Alpha Mount, Phil Gold, who brilliantly recruited Jerry Baddist, Armin Aprikian, Jerry Peltier, Michel Tremblay, Morag Park, Alan Never, and Webb Cavani. Webb, I still work with at NFCR. We're on the board together, so we've stuck it out through. Jonathan Meekins gave me this tie after my first term. It's the surgical tie, 
for basically having kept my word. We had a brilliant relationship. So as I said, Phil recruited Jerry, I recruited Irv and some chap called Eduardo Franco and it was really off to the races. I just want to pay tribute to the people who helped me. Dick Cruz and Sylvia were inspirational in teaching, teaching me leadership and teaching. I was in te teaching me leadership and also in teaching. David Johnston, what can one say? I never forget him bouncing down the stairs at the old General Bronfman building to inaugurate the building. And who else could remember 10,000 names and 10,000 biographies. The Bronfman family really became friends. Marjorie and I used to go to concerts, dinners, and we spent a week every February in Palm Spring, literally fundraising for McGill. Cappy, one of the dominant forces in Montreal, welcomed me into her family. We had multiple vacations together and it was just a symbiosis of pulling and building the department and building McGill. The indomitable, indomitable, irreplaceable, irrepressible Sheila Kustner, who was a force to be, uh, to be uh, challenged. So many donors, so many chairs, so many fellowships were granted. We established the Grand Rounds jointly with the University of Montreal through Adrian Angleman, and it was a total melding of the two universities. Brilliant scientists, clinicians, bonded with the community and society. I especially wish to respect my St. Mary's and Vilmary colleagues with whom I continue to do tumor boards, my wonderful, wonderful partner and next chair, Henry Chabata, Rosary DeMarco and Brian Smith, who were my left hand and right hand voice of conscience, Mark Bramvis, a brilliant scientist, and the department has only gained strength. Jerry has built one of the greatest translational centers internationally. Eduardo has done so much in terms of cervical cancer, HPV, and has more honorary doctorates than anybody can name. So I will close as Churchill said, not now for the now, new, now from the glories of the past to the treasures of the future. Today we've seen Justine, Nicole, Maria, Renata. Dean Eidelman mentioned the chap next door to me who had his leg amputated and the fact that I'd been head of developmental chemotherapy. There were no treatments when I was born. So we've now been through chemotherapy, targeted therapies in the 80s, immunotherapy, surgical and radiation techniques have been hugely refined. And remember, mm -hmm. Louise, of course, that radiation therapy is synergistic with immunotherapy. I will close by saying Vince DeVita has written a book, The Death of Cancer. Bert Vogelstein says that we have all the tools to conquer the disease. Jose Bezelga quoted before he passed away uh, uh, earlier this year, now is our time. Eduardo, we have built a phenomenal department. Well, I truly believe that cancer can be made into a chronic disease within the next 10 years. I truly thank you for this award. Um, the generation of people that you've been recognizing under these uh, Gerald Bronfman fellowships is going to be the people that take us to the end. 10 years it is. I thank you both so much and all of my colleagues. That was, that was really well said. Thank you very, very much uh, for those uh, inspiring words. Um, uh, I, I believe, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Eduardo, I now have the responsibility of giving the farewell toast. Well, um, in, of course, uh, in our office, they don't allow any alcoholic beverages. So like Eduardo, I'm drinking tea or something, something else. Uh, so in honor of uh, Dr. Brian Leland Jones and all of this year's luminaries, 
in honor of the department, its ongoing accomplishments in the face of adversity, under the exceptional leadership of Dr. Franco and the wonderful oncology community, I propose a toast uh, to the Gerald Bronfman Department of Oncology. Long may she reign. And I wanna thank you all uh, for what you're doing for patients, uh, for research here at McGill, across Quebec, across Canada and internationally. Merci à tous. Hey, bonne soirée. Merci vraiment. Thank you all very much for coming.